The following program is for a mature audience and may contain detailed descriptions of violence. Discretion is advised. After the cataclysm, the first peoples of Karamikos came from the north. They were the Temoran humans from Central Brune. They crossed Darakin, arriving in BC 2500, and rapidly built an agricultural civilization of Bronze Age city-states along the southern coast of the known world. Little is known of their ways. The rise of the Temorans, the ancient writing of Allura a theory. Date Nightdane 5 Felmont AC 1000 Time 350 PM Party Status Ilyana 6 hit points Yolanda 6 hit points Kathbad 2 hit points The party are attempting to make it through a door on the eastern wall of the throne room but a battering wind has pushed them back and knocked two of them prone but they will not give up so easily Two of them must make strength checks to stand up and all further strength checks to move forward the wind will reduce the character's movement speed to half, and each turn spent moving, the characters will need to perform a further strength check or be pushed back 10 feet. When they are pushed back, they will need to make a dexterity check or fall prone and take further damage. Kathbad is pushed back a further 10 feet by the wind. He slips and hits the floor hard, taking a hit point of damage. He only has one hit point remaining. He does not dare try to stand up again for fear of death. Meanwhile, Yolanda can't find the strength to get to her feet, but Ilyana does. She takes 20 feet of her movement speed to stand up and manages to move forward 10 feet. A moment later, Yolanda manages to get to her feet. She also takes 20 feet of her movement speed and manages to move forward 10 feet. Ilyana moves a further 30 feet out into the eastern corridor, beyond the open doorway, into the heart of the wind. As the door was ripped from its hinges, she cannot attempt to close it. Ilyana and Yolanda make it a further 30 feet forward. They are now within 30 feet of a door at the end of the 30 foot wide eastern corridor. Yolanda is pushed back 10 feet. She manages to stay on her feet. Ilyana makes it to the door at the end of the corridor. She tries to open it. It's stuck. Yolanda is pushed back another 10 feet. She is now knocked prone. Ilyana withstands the battering wind and tries to open the door again. She pulls it with all her might and this time it opens. She makes it through to the other side, where somehow, as if passing through a magical field, the wind abruptly stops and she is met with complete silence. As she glances back into the corridor, she can see Yolanda still struggling against the silent wind. Wait for me there, she tries to say, but Yolanda cannot hear her words beyond the magical barrier. Instead, she gestures with a hand to signal Yolanda to get down. Yolanda understands, and she makes it to the ground and waits. Ilyana turns to face the room. There is a large hole in the centre of the floor, where the floor has partially collapsed. 
There is a long, narrow table on the east wall containing a balance and weights, mortar and pestle, and various empty flasks and bottles. There is also a glowing sphere suspended in the air just above the table. In order to reach the table, Ilyena must jump across the hall in the floor. The hall is only about five feet deep, but its bottom is filled with tall spires of jagged rock sharp enough to cause serious harm. There is a set of narrow stairs at the north end of the room which descend into a narrow tunnel. There is also a door at the south end of the room, however, Ilyena will have to traverse the hall in the floor to reach it. She takes some time to rest while she decides what to do next. Ilyena pulls out a hand-sized mirror from her backpack. She passes the top of it over the threshold of the door. As she suspected, the mirror is not pulled from her hands by the wind while she has hold of the base from the other side of the doorway. This gives her an idea. She unravels her 50 feet of rope and ties it around her waist and positions herself as close to the threshold as possible, carefully passing the rope through. On the other side, it is caught by the wind and pulled 50 feet down the corridor towards Yolanda and Cathbad. They just need to move far enough forward to grab hold of the rope. For Yolanda, the rope is only inches out of reach. Yolanda will roll a strength check to stand up. She cannot make it off the ground. She gestures for Cathbad to stay put for now and she tries again. With a strength of six and a penalty to the roll, this is not an easy task for her. Come on, Yolanda, she says to herself. You can do this. Stay tuned to find out what happens next. Claudius Tagaris stood before the peculiar woman. She looked to be in her mid-twenties, a small, slight Traladaran woman with straight black hair and brown eyes. She wore the colourful garments of a palm reader. You're a fortune teller then, said Claudius. My name is Elia, the woman said gracefully. This is my house. With a deft hand, Elia held out a palm towards Claudius. Hmm, I don't have time for your heresy came Claudius's impatient response. Elia looked amused. I promise information for silver. The information will not come from your palm, but from tangible knowledge. No magic tricks. If you want to find your brother, I can help you. Why help me? I'm not doing it for your benefit. It's for your brother. I also find it astonishing that you just happened to stumble into my little abode. Perhaps it's fate. Perhaps it's the will of Terastia. Elias smiled again. This time, there was a hint of condescension. I suspect he'd be better off with you. At least for a while until things settle down. How did you know I was looking for him? I have my sources. Some might also say you look very much alike. Claudius let out a momentary snarl before slamming down a silver piece on the counter. Elias smiled once more. Alexander is in hiding. He cheated a very renowned card player out of a lot of gold. This has resulted in the suffering of poor families from the old quarter. Claudius listened intently as Elias continued. This card player had a lot of property, so he raised his rents to pay his gambling debts. A lot of people couldn't pay. Now they want your brother's blood. Claudius let out another snarl. He will repent. Where is he hiding? The kingdom of thieves are protecting him. Give me an address.
In the previous few episodes of Tales of Mistara, I've introduced some solo role-playing rules to simulate character behaviour to avoid metagaming. I'm going to expand on this further now to give you a little more insight into what goes on behind the scenes in my games. I've already touched on how I change my perspective from a player to a dungeon master and make a role to determine what action a character will take. I've also touched on the simple mechanics I use to determine whether a character will check for traps or listen for noise. Now I'm going to discuss how I handle character role-playing. Character role-playing seems to be a significant barrier for many would-be solo role-players. I've also wrestled with this obstacle and found a solution that works well for me. Here's how it works. First, I determine a character's alignment, which is either Law, Neutral or Chaos in BECMI D&D. Once this is decided through a roll on a D6 in my case, with 1 to 3 resulting in Law, 4 or 5 Neutral and a 6 needed for a Chaotic character, I then give the character a Virtue, a Vow and a Vice. I do this for each of my characters. A virtue can be something like faith, or charity, or community, or hard work, and so on. It's basically a word to summarise a moral standard which the character holds in high regard, and therefore feels compelled to behave in accordance with whenever the opportunity is presented. A chaotic character might have a virtue such as power, pride, independence which are not necessarily evil virtues, but could compel a character down a darker path. I decide on a virtue by rolling on a table with three columns, one for each alignment and twelve virtues in each column. I choose a vow and a vice in much the same way, by rolling on a table. These are not tied to an alignment. A vow is a solemn promise a character has made to themselves. An example could be, pay a debt to someone who saved your life. A vice represents a negative trait or immoral, wicked behaviour the character exhibits, which is essentially a weakness. An example of this could be, a need to win arguments or, thinking everyone is beneath me. With a virtue, vow and vice in operation for each of my characters, their behaviour or action in a given situation is often well informed. I also let these three V's influence character dialogue. There are often times when it seems natural or obvious that a character would speak up about something specific. But on the other hand, without any kind of prompting, it's quite easy to forget to incorporate character dialogue into a solo Dungeons and Dragons campaign. To ensure I don't miss this important element, each time I have determined which character will act, based on rules I discussed in episode 1, I then roll on a table to determine whether a character will speak, and if so, which topic the character will talk about. This roll is done on a d6, and on a roll of 1 to 3, the character says nothing. But if it is a 4, 5 or 6, they will speak, and their dialogue will be influenced by a virtue, vow or vice. This basically gives a context that heavily influences the dialogue, and in turn, the dialogue reveals something about the character's personality, and helps to keep them consistent. I do not include any of the dice rolls in relation to these roleplay mechanics in this podcast. They remain behind the scenes. I also keep the virtues, vows and vices of my characters a secret, in hope that over time, their personalities will be revealed naturally. If you find this information useful, and would like to review the tables I use to generate the three V's and the character dialogue, I will post them in a typed up article covering this discussion on my blog at solodungeoncrawler.blogspot.com. 
now, back to the game. The party are fighting against a strange magical wind blowing from the eastern hallway leading from the throne room of the mysterious palace of Evandur. Ilyena has made it into a room at the end of the eastern hallway where the wind has ceased to exist. Cathbat and Yolanda are lying prone and Yolanda is trying to reach the length of rope Ilyena has left for her. She attempts to move against the wind just far enough to grab hold of the rope. But it's no use. Instead, she crawls. I will give her a plus five strength bonus to her strength check for this. Yolanda rolls a five. Her minus one strength penalty would make it a six and the strength bonus of five reduces the result to one which is way under Yolanda's strength of six. This might seem a little confusing, but when you perform an ability check in BECMI, as I discussed previously, you need to roll less than your ability score to succeed. Therefore, bonuses to this roll would be subtracted and penalties added. This means that Yolanda's strength check was a success. Yolanda moves forward at half speed. Ilyena lowers herself to the ground as best she can to bring the rope down lower. It's enough for Yolanda to easily take hold. Yolanda will attempt to tie a further 50 feet of rope to the end so it's long enough to reach Cathbad. This will require a dexterity check. She does this with very little problems. The rope is now long enough for Cathbad to take hold with a single hand and steady himself with his cane. The party are able to move through the windy corridor and join Ilyena. It takes them about three turns to make it through. After making it over the threshold and recoiling their rope, the most obvious thing for the characters to do at this point is to descend the stairs at the north end of the room, as it seems at first glance to be the least treacherous activity. Ilyena lights a torch and takes the lead, followed closely by Yolanda and then Cathbad. They descend the stairs into darkness. After 60 feet in a narrow 10 foot wide tunnel, the party ascends an identical staircase at the north end. They emerge into a 40 foot by 40 foot square room. It is the lower part of a ruined tower. The upper floor of the tower has collapsed, leaving large pieces of scattered rubble about the floor. It is now open to the elements. However, the walls are mostly intact apart from a few holes. And as there is no longer a stairway intact, the party cannot see over the walls. The characters take a turn to search the tower thoroughly, but they turn up nothing. Defeated, they return to the previous room, passing back through the underground tunnel. At the other side, Ilyena snubs her torchlight. The party decides to try the south door this time. To reach it, they need to jump over the hole in the floor, however, the south end of the room can be reached over a narrow part of the hall, so I will not make the characters perform an ability check to do so. They easily hop across. Ilyena and Yolanda do this, followed by Cathbad, who folds up his cane into a compact hand-sized tube and also hops over. This attracts spurious looks from the two women. Ilyena opens the door. Beyond the door is a room in what must be the lower southeastern tower. It is much the same as the northeastern tower. The upper floor of the tower has collapsed, leaving large pieces of scattered rubble about the floor, and it is now open to the elements, with walls still completely intact. The sky is slowly starting to lose daylight above their heads. We should probably leave before it gets dark and come back at half moon, says Cathbad. Just a little longer, responds Yolanda, as she searches the room. 
she discovers a large shelf on the south wall stocked with various empty bottles and vials, most of which are empty or broken. However, four portions are still intact. They appear unlabeled, so it is difficult for characters to tell what effects they will have. Any ideas, Cathbad? Ilyana asks. Potions always have a different smell and colour, so even two potions with the same effect can appear completely different until used. Cathbad can sip the potions in order to identify them. However, even if one of them is poisoned, Cathbad will still suffer the poison's effect. Cathbad will make an intelligence check to see if he can identify any obvious danger. This one is definitely poison, he says, placing the glass vial in his backpack. How do you know? Ilyena asks. The shelf is labelled, he responds, wiping dust away to reveal the elven script a little more clearly. It translates to something along the lines of danger of death. He's quite confident in his ability to identify poisonous plants from his agricultural background besides. He confidently sips the three remaining potions. A potion of animal control, healing, and this is a love potion. He contemplates thoughtfully and then deposits the potions in his backpack. He passes the healing potion to Yolanda and then the characters return to the previous room where they rest for a turn. While they are resting, Ilyena asks Cathbad if he has any idea what the magical sphere suspended above the table is. Cathbad will perform an intelligence check to see if he recalls anything from his education with Pabarin Ivanos. He has no idea. He simply shakes his head and crumples his chin in response. Do you think it has anything to do with the wind? Ilyena asks. Possibly, Cathbad responds. I have no idea. Looks like we are crawling back down the corridor then, Yolanda says. It takes the party three turns to do this, and as it is getting dark, they crawl towards the entrance hall where Bella awaits. It takes them a further two turns to do this, but once they cross the threshold of the entrance hall, as though passing through another magical barrier, the wind stops and they are met with silence once more. Ilyena attempts to open the palace's main doors. They won't open she says in a panic. She tugs on them as hard as she can, but the doors will not budge an inch. We're locked in, says Yolanda. Are the party trapped in the mysterious and treacherous palace of Evandur, between the entrance hall and the howling wind beyond the threshold? Night is falling, and soon it may be too dark to see. What horrors might lurk in this place after the sun sets? And will the party survive them? Find out next time. You have been listening to Tales of Mistara. I sincerely hope you have enjoyed this episode. Stick around, and after a short interval, I will read out some listener correspondence. If you would like to send a small donation to show your appreciation and help support this show so it can continue to grow and expand, then please visit paypal.me forward slash Tom DND. In this episode, I'd like to thank Vinny, Mark and Johannes for their kind donations in August. Thank you so much. If you have listened on YouTube, please give this video a like. Feel free to add a comment to let me know your thoughts. If you don't want to miss a future video, then make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon to receive a notification when I upload a new one. If you have listened using a podcatcher such as Apple or Google Podcasts, Podbean, Amazon or Audible, then I'd appreciate it 
if you would leave a five star review. These things really help and they let me know that the work I put into this show is worth it and that I'm making content that people like. Another way you can support this show is by sharing it with your friends or followers on social media. Recommendations go a long way in bringing in new listeners and ensuring the continuation of the show. Now for some listener correspondence. Mark left the following message with his PayPal donation. Just to express my thanks to the quality of your work on YouTube. You really love D&D and it shows. My friend and I love to listen to you before our own campaign to get in the mood. Thanks again for everything. No problem, Mark. I really hope you and your friend are having a blast with your own campaign. I'd be interested to know what game system you're playing. Finimagus left a comment on YouTube. I will sound repetitive, but you get better with each episode, Tom. The sound effects, songs you choose, how you split the episode between the great rain of fire, etc., adventure, your solo rules, everything is working so well. The techniques you develop to avoid metagaming are really clever. You had mentioned them in the previous episode, and that helped me a lot. This time around, you touched specifically on the thief skills, and the way you tackled the matter really makes sense. I had been wanting to play solo D&D for many years, but I would always get stuck on metagaming. Then I'd stop the campaign right there due to frustration. Now you are providing us with the tools. Like someone mentioned, I found you at the right time. Congrats and thank you. Look forward to more. P.S. I have just finished DMing Mr. Mia to my group, only one player, and will now bring the party to Evander. That's how great your inspiration is. Thank you for your kind comments. It means a lot to hear that I am improving the format as I go. In regards to the metagaming stuff, I'm happy to hear they are helpful. Much more to come in that regard. Also, I hope your group game in the Palace of Evander works out. I'm flattered that you plan on running it alongside the podcast. I'm hoping to release maps and monster stats periodically as this season progresses, so keep checking my blog. I'm also hoping to publish the whole adventure written up on the DMs Guild once the season has finished. Thank you for the comments. Keep them coming. I'll pick out one or two each episode. Every comment you leave, positive review, like, subscription or recommendation makes a difference. It ultimately keeps this alive, and I really appreciate it. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for listening, and as always, see you next session.